Christmas to some echoes, a little bit of Imogen's and Lily's lovely talk, um, but much more so of Ben's. Um, but we're, as, as Jenny said, a bit of a different process. I always have to put Coventry in anything I do because no one knows where the Herbert is if I leave it be. We are named after Sir Alfred Herbert, who is a, a local machine tool manufacturer. So this is a project we started a few years ago, and it was really to tackle the bulk finds at our off-site store. So what was our problem, and, how, and perhaps why hadn't we started tackling it before three years ago? So at the Herbert, we've got an on-site store, which is mostly the metalwork, uh, and that is, for the purpose of this talk, largely documented and where we want it to be. It could always be improved. The off-site store, however, mostly contains the bulk finds, but also quite a lot of uh, some of the smaller finds and some of the historic excavations. But it does have very poor lighting. Uh, the toilet was condemned for several years. It's only just got back into use, and I haven't dared use it yet. Uh, there is no heating, uh, which makes winter incredibly miserable, and it does look like that we might remain that way because of energy prices. Uh, and a bit like other people's experiences, we do have mould, so there is a health and safety issue. Uh, as you can imagine, with all of that, uh, and the lift is condemned, uh, the... <laughs> There is no Wi-Fi there, you might be really shocked to hear that. Uh, and when we first started this project, I didn't have a laptop, so everything had to be done on paper records and then transferred back at the Herbert. I do now have a laptop, but it means downloading whatever information I want from the database onto a Word document and then re-editing it and editing back when I get back to the Herbert. So, as far as I knew, there was no listings of the bulk finds, but as you do when you start these projects about part Quite a long way through, we actually found there someone had been doing box listings in the 90s, and they're all in paper folders at the off-site store. Um, so they have, they have, and will continue to be useful. And as you can see, and probably more so in the next slide, um, quite the next, uh, quite a lot of the items haven't been touched since they were deposited in the museum. So I thought I was going to have the worst slide of boxes, uh, but Ben, I think you won that with the his assorted boxes. Um, yeah, it's a pretty sorry state, and my motivations in 2019 were that we'd got a bit of a gap in the programme, we'd got time to do some collections where uh, we hadn't got so much temporary exhibition commitments, and for me, as sort of like leading on the archaeology collection, it just needed doing, and I really wanted to do something about this collection so we could better access it and knew the size of it and what was where. The following year, that became perhaps a more pressing reason that we should be moving stores from our fiery building to potentially uh, a blue and yellow uh, flat pack furniture store that closed in Coventry. Um, that it has been public information, uh, but it is, I have to say, between us looking perhaps like the cost of materials might mean that project doesn't go ahead. But I really do want it to because the Friary should be accessible to the public and not a museum store, and the museum collections deserve something better than where they are now. So I did come up with a plan, uh, and that plan was a three-pronged attack. So it was a quick and very literally dirty off-site box survey, uh, which was done on paperwork and then onto the spreadsheet because that was the easiest way to sort it. We did also list the stone and woodwork at the off-site store, and parallel to that, we also looked at the paper archive to really understand what information we had about all the different sites we're looking at the bulk finds. So I did use some very willing volunteers. Uh, some lots of students uh, spent the summer with us, which is absolutely the time to be at the off-site store. The local archaeology group, when they'd finished their summer digging, came to us for the autumn into winter. And they were the group that split between doing a lot of the box listing um, and also um, doing the, half of them did the paper archive. I did also make use of volunteers. I'm going to mention Lou again in a minute, but she's been an absolute superstar. And we started some volunteers again this summer. And I, I was occasionally willing, I should say unwilling, senior curator, because uh, I think I've got a bit more passion for the archaeology collection than he has. Um, which, uh, and sometimes I can't really blame him, so. 
So I came up with a plan. We'd achieved quite a lot, actually, in 2019. And this is what we ended up. This is what our spreadsheet looked like. Um, this is just a small section of it. Um, but we would chose the spreadsheet because it means you can filter it, you can sort the information and really play about with it, which is particularly when we thought we were moving, that might be really helpful. I think one thing we under-recorded was which boxes need to be new boxes. You could saw from that photograph. It's probably, probably maybe even more than 60% uh, than estimated earlier. So I think, and particularly if we re-look at how, how things are boxed. So we did, alongside this, I was able to update our site code list, which is a tracking of, of what we issued to field units. So on the left, you can see what it had originally, all the standard information you'd want to know. But I was able to expand it to give us a fuller picture of each archive, uh, whether what state the report was in, if it existed, uh, what the content of the paper archive, and whether there were fines or not. And actually, this is going to be really key as we continue to do the project because some sites are only attested through fines. Some site codes, I actually still don't know where they were in Coventry, if they were in Coventry. Uh, and some, some we, one site we've just got drawings for, so goodness knows where the rest of that is. I am slowly discovering some former Coventry archaeologists that have got some of their paperwork and possibly fines in their homes. One of the chaps had them for 30 years trying to persuade him to give them back to us so we could actually maybe get something published. So, yeah, very boring slide. This is our site list. Again, a spreadsheet, and then we've expanded it with all this information uh, where we know it. So, again, I'm hoping this might become useful. So I've talked a bit about what we have done, but what we didn't do, because it was a very quick, um, and I went to the big picture idea of our project, so we did find out we've got about 3,500 boxes at the off-site store. Might become more with repacking, um, but we didn't check the, whether the outside matched the inside. Uh, some volunteers were a bit more thorough than others, and they were quite keen to go, go inside. Uh, I did not double-check whether the information was correct, uh, and I did not check my own data entry was correct, so I'm sure there's some little errors along the way. Uh, I have not accessed all the boxes because some of them were inaccessible, but actually I had a breakthrough in the last week about that, so I'm pleased to show you that in the next slides. And I have not either transferred all the information into the database. So at the off-site store, maybe 300, you know, less than 10% of the boxes are on our database ad lib, and those are things that have come in more recently and we've done to box level. Obviously, ideally, at the end of all this, we'll have everything down to bag level, but we shall see. But what we have done is I can much more readily make cake boxes with that, data, uh, that spreadsheet. So when I've had research inquiries, someone wanted to locate some charterhouse skeletons, and actually without having to go through the whole store, I was able to quite quickly locate those boxes. And my volunteer, Lou, she's an absolute star. She doesn't get a picture because she's on a four-month holiday to Scotland, and I'm a bit salty about that, <laughs> to be honest. Um, but she has created this map for us, which really helped... Um, picture really visually where excavations have been in the city and it's also helping me because traditionally in Coventry a lot of the excavations have been in the city centre or at the Lent Lane and Fort but we're getting more and more greenfield site buildings around the edge so we are expecting more archaeology to keep coming into the museum. And she's also writing a summary of each site which hopefully we'll be able to promote to researchers of all kinds and um, perhaps we can get some of these sites written up that haven't been touched yet. Uh, so this is just a quick one. This is why I couldn't access uh, all the boxes. And then I tidied it up, hooray, with my volunteer. And these were the boxes that I was kind of like curious what was in them, or, you know, not all of them had anything written on the outside. I was half hoping they might be empty, but the ones I got down last week, surprise, surprise, full of archaeology. Um, so, yes, that's another maybe 100 boxes I need to get down and have a proper look at. So... When I started, I didn't know how it would go, and I'm, it's wonderful that we've got this far, but I think it's okay to sometimes take stock and think. It's okay to take a deep breath, have a little cry, think about what we're doing next. But we are doing next. We do want to look at disposal, uh, and I'm happy, would love to chat to anyone who's got experience on this. Uh, this CEB 87, it's a Roman site, and luckily a an archaeologist has volunteered to write it up for us. And within that, maybe about half the boxes are undiagnostic pots that I think we'll be able to dispose of. 
I'm hoping to find some money to process our 100 boxes of soil samples, or at least a selection of them. And we are looking at the minute to get a big picture review by a field archaeologist, basically doing that deselection uh, of items that would have been done on site that weren't in the 70s, 80s, 90s, and perhaps do them retrospectively now that's in the museum. And a bit like probably lots of people were thinking about uh, targeting things like pot and CBM and perhaps animal bone. So I do hope if we move store that we will move to standard box sizes with the standard information, do the right by the animal, the human remains and reboxing where required. And it certainly is, we've got some human remains in 30 centimetre square boxes, so that's no good. And then we can start moving on to another team of volunteers to accession over the site where possible. So this is where I hope to be, and I hope all of that will take me to a place where I can put on an exhibition about the archaeology of puppetry in more detail than our history gallery. So perhaps I'm hoping if it goes ahead, we'll have you to Coventry in a few years' time with an exhibition and a, uh, and a new store. Let's keep our fingers crossed. Mm -hmm.